Hello everyone, and welcome to today's Kerbal Space Program Adventure. And in today's Kerbal Space Program Adventure, we will be adventuring to the surface of Kerbin's mintiest satellite, the Flats of Minmus. And we will be doing so in this as yet unfinished SSTO, which you can see me constructing here. If you care not for time-lapse builds, then you can skip ahead to 5 minutes 20 to get to the flight itself, but it would seem that the majority of you enjoy the builds, and given that this ship's design is heavily centred around its unique aesthetics, I, I thought it would be a good candidate for a speed build video to kind of place before the mission itself. Now some of you may have noticed the rather striking parallel between this craft and the one I uploaded last week, namely by the fact that both aircraft have this closed box wing design. I went for the box wing again for a few reasons. First and foremost, people responded quite positively to the wing layout of the last aircraft and it was generally quite well received. Uh, and secondly, it actually inspired quite a few people on my Discord server and you know, even on the KSB subreddit to post pictures of their own interpretation of a box wing aircraft, which I must say, you know, it's, it's rather flattering and I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I could provide a source of inspiration for your builds. However, the aircraft last week was just that, an aircraft. Today's craft will not only be able to dominate the skies of Kerbin, but also to breach the final frontier of space itself. As such, we've discarded the whiplash engines in favour of the rapiers, with some added nervers as well to facilitate hyper-efficient flight once we're in space. This thing has also been kitted out with massively increased fuel reserves to enable its increased range, and it has been stripped of its command pod and one of its passenger bays just to help keep its mass nice and low to enable us to fly it to Minmus and back. However, I'd say that this is still quite a capable ship. It has capacity for 48 passengers in its cabins, as well as ample room for heavy cargo as well. And it probably won't be 48 passengers when we actually get to it because, you know, they need their space. It will probably be more like, I don't know, 20 passengers maybe. So lots and lots of room for walking around. There'll be bars in here, there's a gym, showers, uh, just, you know, all the, all the bells and whistles really. We'll have a pool table. So it's, it's going to be great. But yeah, there's, there's room for ample cargo as well. For this video, I'll be demonstrating its cargo carrying abilities by loading up the bay at the back with 3,225 units of ore, which has a total weight of just over 38 tonnes, which is heavier than the Rocco Max Jumbo 64 fuel tank or, you know, that big orange one, as it's more commonly known. I've actually, uh, I've actually got the wiki page open on my other monitor just so I could remember the name of that tank so I could, you know, do, you, could do a good... Uh, do a good commentary here because normally I don't really have I don't really know I'm, I don't really have a reference and I always just say oh I'll look it up afterwards so no it's it's the it's the Rocco Max Jumbo 64 fuel tank aka the, the big orange one I don't know why this was a weird tangent wasn't it uh, yes whilst the craft can carry the weight of the the big orange tank to Minmus surface and back again uh, it's optimized to assume that you would sort of drop the cargo off whilst on the surface. Uh, the reason for the cargo bay, as I briefly mentioned uh, as the overall goal for this mini-series last episode, is to help with the infrastructure of my upcoming hotel and casino base on Minmus, which will be my tourism outpost that I can charge huge amounts of money to eccentric billionaires to stay at in order to help fund my space program. Uh, so this craft will provide the means to get passengers to and from the hotel, however, you know, it would need cargo space to both carry the passengers' possessions as well as to restock the base with food, uh, water, shampoo, uh, gym equipment, you know, those those miniature chocolates you get on your pillow, you know, all, all, all the stuff that hotels need to keep running. I thought that one orange tank's worth of mass would be a good value to aim for with regard to how much cargo capacity we'd need, so that's why I've gone for this value. And, you know, just to really prove that it can, we've actually gone slightly over uh, that weight, just so we can absolutely confirm without a shadow of a doubt that it's capable. Also, it means that we can dump the ore quite easily without leaving any big debris on the surface of Minmus, because, you know, when you dump ore, it doesn't leave anything behind. So, yeah, that's why it's an ore tank, not the actual orange tank itself. I know I mentioned earlier that this thing has some uh, resemblance to a craft I uploaded last week, but it also has near identical, well, it is identical to a craft I uploaded this week on uh, Tuesday, I think. It was like an explosion montage, I called it the Kraken Plane, uh, where this thing just kept on spontaneously exploding on the runway. Not actually a problem or a design flaw with the craft itself as such. Basically, to do these kind of nice slow panning shots around the craft, I often use the slow motion physics mod. It's from Better Time Warp. You can do physics mod, but slow motion. And when you do slow motion mods, uh, you can pan the camera around a lot slower, uh, but it can sometimes cause crack and glitches. Hence why that video is also in slow-mo. So don't worry, this craft doesn't really spontaneously explode on the runway, uh, you know, unless you kind of really 
force it to by jumping in and out of time warp in quick succession. But with that, here we go, firing the engines ready for launch. Now, unlike a lot of engines in this game, the rapiers don't start out at full thrust when you're coming from a standstill. So I initially uh, set the engines off with the brakes of the aircraft on to allow them to the rapiers to spool up uh, as much as possible before we switched off the brakes and allowed ourselves to power forwards. Unfortunately, the runway is not quite long enough to enable this thing to take off. I don't think it's anything to do with the design of the craft itself because it does start to get off the ground, but then we just end up running out of runway. But luckily, KSP's runway kind of ends on like a sort of cliff edge, not a cliff edge, but there's a drop off after the runway so you can just get airborne anyway. But uh, that's, the, that's the only thing I didn't like about this craft, and it's one thing um, I wish I'd probably improved upon. I mean, it does. I think it does take off pretty well when you don't have the orange tank in the cargo bay, or as I've done in this video, lots of ore in the cargo bay. Uh, but yeah, that's the only issue really that I had, so maybe I'll try and iron that out before um, we put this thing into service for real with the tourists. Now, the flight plan is pretty standard. We're going to be coasting around at pretty much sea level, or at least below uh, 1,000 meters, whilst we uh, throttle up to about 420, 440 meters per second. This is the point at which the rapiers kick in and have the maximum amount of thrust, and then we'll start to rapidly increase in speed. And, in do and when, when we're in this phase of the flight, we can start pointing ourselves upward and rapidly gain some height. So you can see me here powering through the sound barrier now island runway in the distance there and now we're kind of you know at that point where the rapiers are throttling up at their ma their maximum amount of thrust <laughs> we can point ourselves up and coast our way up to the uh, to to space i guess <laughs> i was gonna say to the upper atmosphere but i guess you know we will still be going upwards after that point so i guess to space we'll be firing up the nuclear engines once we're a little bit higher because they have pretty bad efficiency on the ground level and um, so a lot of people don't know this about the nuclear engines because they're the most efficient engine in the game after the ion engine uh, but uh, in thick atmospheres they're they're very bad uh, they're really only designed for vacuums not that they'd be much help in the lower atmosphere anyway because their thrust is so bad but in addition to having poor thrust they actually have very bad efficiency as well in thick atmospheres as well you can pretty much get away with it on juna but Lath and Eve, especially Eve, you've got no chance with nuclear engines at ground level. But ground level is something that we are not at right now as we pass the 14 kilometer mark. So we're getting to that point where we can start to think about firing the nuclear engines. There's not much point at the moment because we're still getting plenty of speed from our rapiers. They haven't started to drop off in terms of their thrust just yet. Generally, I try and aim for about 1500 meters per second on rapiers in air breathing mode, with the nuclear engines being activated sort of between the 170 to 200,000 meters to mark. That's kind of a good point at which the atmosphere is thin enough where we may as well be in a vacuum with regard to the efficiency of the nuclear engines. And there they go now. So we got four of them and I, I kind of liked the way the plumes uh, appeared on this sort of flat plane. I thought it looked pretty nice. We got one of them, we got two of them offset into the middle of the uh, the four uh, rapier engine clusters and then we just got two more either side of those rapier clusters. And I think it just really came together. I really liked the way this craft ended up looking actually. And we've also got some Werner engines at the very front of the craft. These are basically, they function exactly like monopropellant engines, as in they're enabled by RCS and they're designed for reaction control, but they use liquid fuel and oxidizer rather than monopropellant, so we didn't have to worry about adding extra monopropellant tanks in order to fuel kind of monopropellant thrusters. And this thing does have excessive oxidizer engineered into it, first of all because your cargo capacity may vary in terms of weight, so you know you may want to increase the, the mass of the cargo slightly, uh, and also to do with the fact that you know it will account for any in inefficiencies or pilot error whilst you're flying it. It's nice to just have a little bit of uh, room for error. So I like to, I always like to pack a little bit of extra oxidizer. Maybe not quite this much. We've got over a thousand units of oxidizer left, which is a little bit overkill. That's almost uh, over 10% of our total oxidizer amount. I, mean, I think 5% is probably a better thing to aim for, but you know, eh, it's fine. Now there was a little bit of a weird glitch here where the thing kept on pitching forwards. You can watch on the nav ball, we keep on pitching forwards. Uh, below the blue marker on the nav ball, so I then started using the Werner engines to kick ourselves up. But I forgot we were on times four physics warp, so then we end up kicking ourselves way too much. What I did was I just quick loaded, uh, well I quick saved, then quick loaded, and then the problem stopped because this shouldn't be pitching forward with the nuclear engines firing because they are pointed along its center of mass, so it's not like, it's not imbalanced or anything. So I'm not quite sure why this was happening and it's never happened to be before or since. It was just a bit of a weird glitch, really. Also, if you're planning on flying this thing, uh, we'll need to deploy the solar panels, first of all, so we can continue generating electricity because we don't have an RTG on board this thing because I thought, you know, 
RTGs, they're made of plutonium. And, you know, the, our tourists, they're not built to withstand radiation as well as our astronauts who we bombard with radiation uh, to get them immune to it. It's like you can vaccinate people against gamma radiation. I think that's how it works, right? That's how it works. You can vaccinate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's why I inject myself with plutonium every day so that when the inevitable nuclear fallout war happens, I'll be fine. So, But obviously our tourists won't have undergone this process, so we haven't got any lead lining either. So uh, it would probably be better, better not to have any RTGs on board this thing. That's that's the reason why I went for it, not because I thought solar panels looked cooler. No, no, it's that. That's the reason. But yes, like I was saying, not only do you need to deploy the uh, the solar panels to keep this thing powered, but you also need to deploy the aerial on top of the, uh, the cabins, which as you can see, I forgot to do at this point because of course I did. And then I couldn't figure out why I suddenly lost control of the ship as we got further away from Kerbin and thus out of range of the probe cores, you know, connection range, basically. Um, because, as you, as I mentioned earlier, this thing has no crew cabin this time because I want it to really have this, this sleeker looking appearance and, you know, again, to save weight, uh, it's probe controlled, which of course means uh, it needs a connection to the KSC in order to maintain functionality. Now, due to the abysmal thrust to weight ratio of the nuclear engines, we couldn't really do one burn alone to get to Minma, so we're doing two. Uh, an upside of this is that we can maximise the overearth effect to make our flight more efficient, although we didn't really need the extra efficiency because this thing is packing more fuel than it needs, so it wouldn't matter either way. But because the burn was going to take so long to do the whole thing in one big go, it made more sense just from a, you know, making sure we didn't re-enter the atmosphere standpoint that uh, we did two burns rather than one. So this is me doing the second one here. Or I guess more accurately, that was me doing the second one there because it's now done. Unfortunately, Minmus's location at the time of our launch meant that we couldn't get a direct Minmus encounter from one burn at Kerbin alone because of our inclination. Well, I mean, we could have, but it would have been expensive to adjust our inclination that close to the planet. It would have made more sense to sort out our apoapsis height first, then do a mid-course correction out in deeper space where it would have been much more much more sort of cheap from a delta v point of view although i did overshoot a little bit here so yeah mimis is on a tilted plane uh, versus kerbin's equator so we had to do a an inclination adjustment for Minmus. Normally I find I don't need to. I, I think I just get lucky that it always seems to be that I can make a, man a maneuver node at the ascending or descending node uh, on Kerbin's equator and then I can just get an encounter without having to do this. But on this occasion, unfortunately, didn't really come together. But, you know, it doesn't take a huge amount of fuel as you saw. And I probably could have done it even more efficiently if I tried a bit harder. But again, as I've mentioned, we have, a, we have excessive fuel for the, what we need to have on this mission, really. So there goes our deceleration burn now to get us on an initial captured orbit at Minmus, but I will then be lowering our orbital height just to make it a little bit easier to pick out a landing spot. It's far easier to land, particularly on Minmus where the gravity is so low, it's much easier to pick a landing spot and land in a specific location from a lower orbit because you can. Kind of, I just find it easier to eyeball. I don't know if it actually is easier or anything, but I, per I personally find it easier. You might not, but I do. And it's my video, so we're doing it this way. <laughs> but yeah, just made a maneuver note here. You want to aim a little bit ahead. Well, in this case here, if your orbit is with the rotation of the planet, you want to aim a little bit ahead of where you want to end up because the planet is going to rotate and put you in the in the correct place, if that makes sense, if you over, if you plan to overshoot a little bit. And then we can just decelerate. Got a little bit liberal <laughs> with the time warp and ended up getting a little bit too close at too high a speed, so I did some extra kicking with the rapier engines with our extra amount of oxidizer just to do that last bit of slowdown. And then we can make sure we don't slam into the ground too fast and hard with the front side of the ship by using the Werner engines to dampen our impact. I'd say that's a pretty nice landing, to be honest. Probably not the smoothest, but again, it's just the f it's just a test run. It's just Jebediah, Bill, and Bob, and they're hardened veterans of space flight, and they can they can handle the G forces there. So we'll try and make it a little bit more gentle when we actually have tourists on board this thing. But for now, we can it's fine. And then we can test out this thing, which was I thought it was a really cool feature at the time, but it didn't really work out that well. So I'll probably end up scrapping it. And it's this the uh, the landing leg feature. So I thought if this thing's going to be spending long periods of time on Minmus. Probably not best to have it sitting on rubber tyres the whole time, because, I don't know, the rubber might get perished or damaged if it's constantly taking the weight of the plane. I don't know, but I thought it might look cool if this thing was, like, sitting on landing legs when it's on the surface of Minmus, or even on the surface of Kerbin if it's just being parked there. But you can see the suspension just constantly bounces it around, and there's no... I couldn't really find a way of making it stop doing that. So that was a shame, and uh, there was another problem later on when we redeployed the wheels. The physics glitched out and it kicked the plane way up into the air, or well, not way up into the air, but you know, way above the surface, and then crashed it back down again, which, you know, not, not a particularly realistic thing to happen. 
But there you go, you get a nice little view there of the uh, the actual shape of the craft. Now we're on the surface of Minmus and we can do a nice cinematic flag plant. And this is going to be our uh, location for the hotel because not only was this mission designed to test out the capabilities and, you know, making sure that the SSTO could get to Minmus and back, but also to do a scout mission to find a location for our Minmus base hotel and casino. And this seems as good a place as any. I thought the flats would be the most ideal location, really, because then we can have, like, you know, cars and stuff. Like, they can do some salt flat racing, or, you know, the equivalent of salt flat racing uh, on the surface of Minmus. Uh, I don't really know what that surface is. I guess it's ice cream. I think that's canon, right? <laughs> There's a quick little shot of the cargo bay, by the way. You can see the ore tanks there. I'm not going to be dumping the ore actually just yet. I wanted to just make sure that this thing could take off from Minmus with the cargo still in there. But then once we do get off the ground, we'll then just dump the ore. But I think we've done enough. We've seen we've seen the sights. We've had we've taken our photographs. We've got our T-shirts. It's time to re-embark the ship and get ourselves back to Kerbin and start, you know. Uh, cooking dinner, I guess. <laughs> so we can take some surface samples and stuff because this is a science. Uh, this is a science mode uh, save. So we could benefit from science, even though we have the tech tree unlocked. If I ever got a mod or there was some new parts released that necessitated having more science, it's always good to have that extra little bit, you know, saved up for a rainy day, so to speak. And now you can. You're about to see the. Uh, one of the flaws with this craft, really, as I mentioned earlier, that'll happen imminently whilst we do all the other pre-flight checks before our launch. Doing some final little shots, seeing what it's like with the flag there as well, fluttering majestically in the wind. None of that was true. It's not fluttering and it's not in the wind either, but you know, you get the you get the sentiment. And that's what I was saying about how when the wheels deploy, they kind of kick into the ground and it glitches it a bit and throws the, uh, the craft up into the air. Luckily, the solar panels or nothing else was destroyed in this process, so it wasn't too bad. But I mean, just from a realism standpoint, not really uh, the best. So I'll probably just end up taking those landing gears off and I'll probably put one on the back tail fin. You know, I've kind of got that biplane-esque tail fin at the back i'll probably stick a couple of landing legs within that structure so when this thing touches its tail onto the ground at minmus it won't be you know landing on its elevator fins it will land on a thing that can absorb impacts <laughs> i thought it make make a more realistic thing and then we can begin our takeoff here so another good thing about the flats is that you know they provide a nice natural runway for a spacecraft to take off horizontally and we're just skimming the ground here. This would take off better if you didn't have all the ore or any other cargo on board, because as I said earlier, the idea would be that you dump that prior to takeoff, but just to prove that it can take off in case you land it in the wrong spot, or you need to move it, or you just want to take the cargo back, you can take it out. So you're about to see our delta V, uh, that's shown at the top right of the, uh, the altitude gauge, just to the right, si right hand side of that. You're about to see that jump up, that's why, because we're just going to dump all the ore and that's obviously going to reduce the weight of the craft quite significantly, so we'll gain a couple of hundred meters per second of delta V. But, you know, we end up finishing the mission with uh, a couple of hundred delta V to spare, so we could have made it back to Kerbin quite easily. And, you know, I'm not doing the most efficient flying, uh, as you can see here. But just making sure now that we can clear those cliffs, and then we can prepare to dump the ore. There we go, so jettison the ore tank there, jettison the ore tank here. One thing I never understood that isn't in the game, and I would really like, is the ability to dump fuel. As I mentioned earlier, we have way more oxidizer than we'll ever need, so it would have been nice to be able to dump the oxidizer, you know, in orbit or somewhere else. Well, I guess there's nowhere else we would have dumped it, because I don't know where it would have been. But it would be nice to be able to jettison fuel. I'm not quite sure why we have the ability to jettison ore, but not fuel. Maybe it's just something that you can't... I guess you can't specify how much ore you're dumping, it's an all or nothing thing. So I guess maybe it would be the same for Oxidizer. But then again, you could dump as much Oxidizer as you want to get rid of. Just put that into one of the empty tanks and then just dump the contents of that tank. And then you'd effectively, you know, be dumping a specific amount of Oxidizer. But oh, I'm sure Squad have their reasons. I don't know. I don't really question it. And there we are just getting ourselves on a Kerbin encounter. So we don't have enough Delta V to do our, you know, return to the Kerbal Space Center using engines alone. We will have to make use of some aero braking, but luckily this thing is built to withstand the heating effects of re-entry, so we should be able to do aero braking, no problems. Especially coming from Minmus, which, you know, relative to interplanetary space, is not that far away from Kerbin, so we won't be coming in at a particularly high speed compared to what we could be if we were coming from, say, Eve or Juna, or, you know, even somewhere further away from those. 
Not that this thing would be able to get to those places very easily. It can definitely, it would probably be able to do Juno. You may need to get rid of some of its cargo. But, you know, I think this is pretty much, this is a Juno capable ship. It's certainly capable of Mun, Gilly, and Ike. So I, I, I see no reason why it could do Juno. But again, you probably have to dump some of its cargo just to ensure that you'd have enough fuel left over to, uh, to do those missions. Well, that's besides the point. That's not the focus of this video. And that's not the purpose of this craft. This craft is designed... Uh, to get people to and from the surface of Minmus. If you wanted to retrofit this to have your own purposes though, I've tried to make it so you can uh, remove the cargo bay uh, part and replace it with, I don't know, another passenger compartment, because the passenger compartments weigh less than an orange tank, so you can kit this out to carry more passengers at the expense of having the ability to carry less cargo, if you so wished. You can download this from the description of the video if you look down below. People were saying they were having trouble finding the link last time, I'm not sure why, because I, I think it's pretty easy to find, it just says craft file followed by a link, you click the link, and the link will say do you want to download, and then you click yes, and then it should download. And that's how you download craft files <laughs> from the description. Also, uh, near the description is a little a little like button and a little a little subscribe and share button if you if you so wish. <laughs> Feel like you have to say that on YouTube these days to uh you know beat the algorithm so you know always appreciate it always appreciate it but don't feel obligated if you don't want to and leave a comment as well about um what you thought of this design i'm always looking for inspiration from real world concepts about you know things to base my craft upon obviously the box wing is a real world concept it doesn't really exist on scales as large as this it's mainly small aircraft and experimental ones that employ box wings uh, but like i say it is a design that has been considered nonetheless and so if you've if you've ever seen a a cool concept like you know like a plans or box box wings, things like that, that you'd kind of like to see me try out. I'd, I'd, I'd like to read, if you leave it in the comments below, I do read all the comments, so, you know, if, if I like your idea, I might just do it. So, who, what have you got to lose, I say? Uh, there we go, we've done, so we've done most of our air braking now, we can do one more to bring our apoapsis right down. We're going to be aiming for about uh, 100 kilometers above the surface, that's generally the height, the altitude I aim for when we're doing aero braking. And then we'll just do one little final burn at apoapsis to bring our periapsis above the atmospheric line so we can more accurately plan our Kerbal Space Center encounter. So yeah, doing... A little bit of shaking around here, doing some rather eccentric flying as we ascend out of the thicker parts of the atmosphere to do as much slowing down as we can. You can see our apoapsis gauge on the top left rapidly falling as I'm doing all these kind of crazy turns using the Werner engines to, you know, increase the amount of spin we're doing just to create as much drag as possible. Again, probably wouldn't do this if we had tourists on board, but this again is just a experimental mission and we do have, you know, super qualified pilots and, as and astronauts on board. They can handle it. So we can get some of our electricity back, because I noticed that we're starting to run a little bit low. And now we're at Apoapsis, we can circularize by burning prograde just to bring our retrograde marker above the 70 kilometer mark, which of course is the atmospheric border in Kerbal Space Program. There we go, 72 kilometers, nice and safe. We are on a slightly inclined orbit, but it's not too much of a problem to be honest. Just wait until the Kerbal Space Center is rotated to be roughly below your orbital line, then you can pretty much just burn retrograde and you should bring yourself into a nice encounter. This time we're orbiting uh, against the speed of the planet. You remember I said earlier on Minmus we had to aim slightly ahead of where we wanted to go because we were orbiting with the rotation of the planet. Now we're orbiting, or moon I should have said, uh, now we're orbiting against the rotation of the planet, so we want to aim to quite a, undershoot by quite a bit because by the time we get to our you know impact location or you know our predicted impact location the Kerbal Space Center would have rotated uh, accordingly so we need to undershoot to ensure that we land in the correct place uh, unfortunately I didn't do a particularly great job here I actually didn't undershoot enough and we ended up you know flying over the top of the Kerbal Space Center which you're about to see now uh, spoiler alert sorry but uh, yeah, that's that's unfortunately what happened. But it didn't matter. We we did make it back. One thing to make note of, though, is that uh, this thing doesn't fly quite as well as it does when the fuel tanks are full. So what you need to do, you just disable the front canards completely. And I actually increased the authority limiter of the rear elevators just to help keep our center of lift nice and far back as possible. Just to make this thing nice and controllable. It still is quite it's quite easy to put it into a stall, especially when we're still very high up in the atmosphere where there's not much atmosphere for the wings to really 
generate lift from so especially whilst we're very high up it can't really fly too well at all once you're below the cloud layer or at least in my version of the game which is about uh, 10 kilometers once you're below that level it will fly pretty well because the air is nice and thick and provides plenty of buoyancy for the wings to keep this thing up and there's Jebediah loving the view as the hot plasma licks the sides of the windows uh, but you know we, we don't we don't we don't mess around at Lown Aerospace, we make sure our windows are created from the finest enameled glass to ensure that it can withstand re-entry heating plasma. And there we go, overshooting the Kerbal Space Center. If this was Taurus, I probably would have quick saved and quick loaded uh, and tried again and made sure we got a more optimal encounter. But again, Jebediah, Bill and Bob, they love a bit of, they love a bit of thrill, thrill seeking and are quite happy to uh, force this thing into a stall by doing lots of crazy turns and spinning it around like this to generate lots of drag to slow ourselves down. Uh, horizontally and then we could do a nice turn around kissing the ground almost um, just to get ourselves back to the Kerber Space Center so yeah I just forced a stall there because I slowed down a little bit too hard and too fast um, this you don't necessarily need to put it into a stall in order to get down to the, the runway but because I was overshooting I just wanted to bleed off as much speed as possible as fast as possible just you know because this video has gone on what we are 25 minutes blue my neck um, it's close, we want this video to kind of wrapped up relatively quickly, so we may as well just force a stall and get ourselves on a on a return back to the Kerbal Space Center. But that's pretty much me running out of things to say, hence why I kept on repeating that. <laughs> I just realized how much I repeated the words, just words in general in that last statement, but whatever. This is us coming down to the runway, so this is me preparing to sign off this commentary. If you like this video, uh, and then obviously, like I said, you can leave a like and subscribe if you so wish. There is also links to my Twitter and Discord and Patreon in the description if any of those things appeal to you. Really trying to get the Twitter off the ground, you know, I've been playing the Twitter game hard, we're posting memes. Uh, actually, that's it. So if you like that sort of thing, then you might like my Twitter. Deploying the parachutes there as we touch down and there we go. So as I said, all those things are in the description. There is also a link on screen now to take you to some more stuff. But that's it. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend.